This time we already have the uh, uh, nanostereo and I'm going to tell how it behaves when you put it in a uh, polymer nanocomposite. But um, just a little bit uh, more about uh, what we already uh, uh, saw uh, the uh, type of sources that we have for biofibers. And uh, actually biofibers uh, are in use uh, as composite, uh, are important for composite materials for longer time, uh, since about the 90s. And that's because, uh, it, it came out because of the environmental concern that was uh, probably Europe the first one to uh, show this uh, uh, concern. And uh, because this type of fiber kind of uh, uh, balance the uh, um, carbon dioxide uh, balance because uh, uh, if you dispose, the, the carbon dioxide that is formed is uh, uh, the same that it took uh, for um, when it was uh, grown, for example. And um, there are um, legal requirements on uh, recyclability and degradation uh, in the use of waste. You want to use waste because uh, there's economical reason on doing that. Uh, you can uh, substitute at least in some things of some fibers, uh, the petroleum uh, derived fiber. Uh, there is uh, value added to traditional cultivation, large availability, we already saw that, low density, of course, for uh, uh, application like uh, automotive uh, is important because if you uh, have to move less weight, then you uh, use less gas. And uh, the fibers are less aggressive than uh, inorganic fiber. So as I said, in the 90s, there was a growing, a very steep growing of this type of materials, mainly the construction in the United States and automotive industry in Europe. And these are the type of things that uh, people, uh, is, uh, that the application that this type of material has is uh, uh, to keep uh, the material uh, with a low density, like wood, usually the structures are, uh, have holes or are so uh, to keep the, as I said, the, the low density as a, a good and uh, mainly in the United States for uh, dating uh, the construction so you don't have to paint every year and uh, this is in, in Europe mainly in the automotive industry like uh, well this is like Chrysler but uh, um, this is Ford, there are also Peugeot is, uh, working on this type of pieces where you put uh, five vegetable fibers onto polymers. But um, that was, as I said, beginning in the 90s, and of course, the logical step is to go uh, nano from, from those fibers. Uh, we already saw this, that uh, they are high modulus, but uh, keep, uh, even when the uh, fibers are very uh, rigid, they allow to maintain the stretching capability of the polymer and you can incorporate, in some cases, unique properties to the uh, material. We saw this one, but now we are going to um, uh, consider uh, a composite. So this part, high modulus, low density, is uh, now very important. Uh, okay, we already saw this one too. It's uh, just to emphasize that we are going to use this uh, type of uh, uh, crystals in the polymer. So let's go to the composite. Okay. So the type of applications that we have is uh, uh, we can have structural applications. That's the most frequent goal. Uh, we are interested in the rigidity of these uh, crystals to reinforce the composite, but also. Uh, they allow to maintain uh, stretchability of the polymer, so we end up with materials that are strong and, and tough. And um, we can have optical properties, we already saw this type of uh, applications where the small size of the nanotubules allow to obtain uh, um, uh, transparent materials or uh, non-reflecting films or color films with non-linear optical response. Uh, conductive, of course, uh, cellulose is non conductive, but it is possible to produce composites with uh, uh, a combination of polyelectrolyte or a conductive polymer, and then you end up with a smart paper 
or paper batteries, you know, the battery that is uh, in a in a baking paper. And we already mentioned that they can be uh, can have medical applications like a scaffold for growing uh, growing uh, soft and hard bone tissues. I can use a hydrogen for drug delivery, a greater sensor. And it, you can tell the, by modification of the cellular crystal so that it can have uh, as a marker also with medical um, objective goals. Well, we already saw this, which is an application for transparency. Uh, we can have this type of applications too, where you have super absorbent gels. Uh, it's like a very uh, um, low density foam that it can absorb uh, a very large amount of water, for example. You can use them as uh, aerogels that are very strong but still flexible. You know, aerogels like the, the ones that come from uh, silica uh, are uh, very uh, low density materials, very uh, uh, hard materials that can be used with uh, insulation properties, for example. And um, so they, they are very, very nice materials, but these ones are also flexible, something that you can get from silica. And these are from people in, uh, working in Sweden. Uh, this is a work for uh, people uh, working in Case Western in the uh, uh, United States. And they are trying to mimic nature. They uh, see that this is a, a sea animal, which is the sea cucumber. And uh, when it uh, uh, um, senses a, a difference in the environment, it can change the rigidity of the skin. So going from something very rigid to something soft as a me uh, measure of uh, you know, protect protection. Uh, so taking this idea, uh, these people uh, work with a material where you can switch on or off the interaction between the non-cellulose rods. When the non-cellulose rods, uh, the, the interaction is on, then you have a percolation, a uh, percolative uh, network uh, 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 through the, um, uh, the material, and so the modulus of the, uh, of the material is very high. But by uh, changing something in the environment, and in this case is uh, humidity, then you switch, you separate the, uh, the off the interaction between the rocks, and then the modulus is governed by the matrix and then it drops uh, very much. And so they can obtain changes in modulus of about 40 times, which is more than uh, they already measure for uh, changes of uh, humidity, uh, uh, changes in the polymer because of humidity. So this is something uh, which is due to the, to the cellular growth. And um, because uh, you obtain the uh, nanocellulose, or because the nanocellulose are obtained in uh, aqua suspension, then the first thing uh, for people to think about obtaining nanocomposites was to use polymers that could use or could also be soluble in water. So you can put the two things together. And, or uh, for that's why they uh, become to starch which is, of course, uh, soluble in water. And, of course, it's also biodegradable material. So you ha ha have now uh, the combination of uh, uh, nanocomposite that it will be uh, uh, biodegradable. And both of them uh, bio-based uh, uh, materials. And so, but the final properties of the nanocomposite depend on the starch, of course, the type of concentration of the cellulose, and also the type of concentration of the plasticizer. Uh, if you do a, a prepare a film from a starch, it's very rigid, but uh, very um, uh, it, it breaks very easily. So you have to use it with a, a plasticizer, and so you end up with what is called a thermoplastic starch. But uh, when you do that, you also increase the uh, uh, starch is already hydroscopic. With the plasticizer, it uh, absorbs humidity even more. So
So we have the uh, interplay of the, uh, all those uh, factors uh, in the uh, um, final behavior of the material. The, so the plasticizer will reduce the Dg of the starch, and that makes the difference between the uh, modulus of the polymer and the modulus of the nanoparticles even higher, yeah? because you have a polymer which is in the uh, rivalry state. And of course, any, any addition of these nanoparticles will show up, uh, will be very, very sensitive in the final materials of the, uh, uh, in the final properties of the material. So we have the uh, combination of these uh, components. This is an example taken from uh, the group of Dufresne, uh, which was one of the pioneers in using uh, nanocellulose and nanocomposites. It's a, a French group. In, uh, uh, and uh, this is a composite made from potato starch and a nanofiber, which if you see is a with which all already microsimulated uh, nanocellulose. And here we have a storage modulus versus temperature. And this is the material, just the starch, without no uh, cellulose. And this is what happens when you add 5%, 10%, and this is of course the, just a, like a nanopaper, uh, see what happens with the nanopaper. So if we look at room temperature, so it's about here, you see that there is an increase of more than 100 with the modulus of the, uh, of the composite with respect to the polymer by just adding 5% uh, nanocellulose. Here we have the young modulus of the material versus percentage of nanofiber, different concentration of glycerol. Of course, the modulus is lower when you are the plasticizer. But in each case, you see that there is an increase in the modulus of the material with the addition of the nanofiber. Still, you can see, we will go back to this, that uh, the uh, increase is uh, much lower now that we have a film, a solid, that what happened here when we had still a suspension. So we will go back to that point later. Uh, this is another example of uh, starch with nanofibers. This is uh, prepared with the uh, goal of uh, packaging material. Here we have a foam, so material which is uh, very low density, but now you have these nano rods uh, reinforcing the walls of the cell in the foam. Uh, so we have a foam that is uh, biodegradable and that can be uh, low weight, is uh, uh, strong, and it can be used, for example, also as a, um, in sandwich structures, as the middle part of the sandwich structure. So, and this is uh, uh, made from also potato starch, and uh, these are nanofibers, so it's not the microfibrillated cellulose, are the shorter uh, nanocrystals. Okay, in the following uh, part of the talk, I will be presenting uh, some of our results in uh, nanocellulose composite, and we worked in uh, polymers that were soluble in organic solvents. And so first I will show the nanocellulose, but very, very briefly, and then we'll go to the two types of polyurethanes that we work. Cross-linked polyurethane elastomers and segmented linear polyurethanes. This all we already saw, so it's the uh, uh, acid hydrolysis of the uh, microcrystalline cellulose to obtain the, nano, uh, the nanofiber. Uh, we, in this case, we use this step, the freeze drying, and then the red dispersion in an organic solvent which was dimethylformamide, which is also a known solvent for polyurethane. So uh, we could put together the two things. Already saw these that are uh, nanometric inside um, uh, crystals. And so let's go directly to the composite. So this is the, uh, the preparation of the translucent polyurethane. So we work it with the uh, polymeric isocyanate from Hansman. Uh, so this is uh, the main part, let's say, of the, of the uh, MDI chain, that is a polymeric uh, MDI. And we used a uh, polyol mixture, a linear one, and this one that was uh, trifunctional. And um, 
So we have here the suspension that was freeze dry and ready on the cell load, freeze dry and ready to start in the metal form of mud with good casualty treatment. And so here we have the first uh, step of the characterization that was the characterization of the fire. Then we mixed with the uh, suspension of the polyols in the metal form of mud. We ultrasonic, uh, use ultrasonication for uh, very sparse uh, the, the nanofibers. And then we uh, evaporate the uh, solvent and we are isocyanate to further uh, casting in, in the mold. So before having the solid, we um, did a second characterization and we will go just uh, right there. This is the uh, biology of the suspension. These are the nanocrystals in the mixture of polyol and MDR. The mixture doesn't gel at room temperature until mo much more than two hours. And you can see here, this is the 0% uh, nanocellulose. It's a viscous, the responsive type of the viscous liquid. This is uh, the uh, dynamic uh, viscosity versus frequency. So there is no change during the, the measurement. Uh, as I said, reaction happens with a much longer time at room temperature. And uh, as we have uh, nanocellulose, this is 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and you begin to see that there is a plateau around here or something around that. And so the, the behavior is already not that of a viscous liquid, but a viscoelastic uh, uh, material. And uh, here you see that there is almost, uh, we are almost losing the, the, the plateau, which will mean that there is a yield uh, for that uh, uh, kind of uh, suspension. Here we have uh, the same uh, data, but plotted as G prime versus frequency. Uh, there is no signal for the uh, storage modules. As I said, the mixture uh, without uh, nanocellulose is a viscous liquid. There is almost uh, everything is noise here, so we don't have a, a good signal for the storage <coughs> modules. But we see that with 0.25%, we already have a behavior which is that of uh, viscoelastic liquid. And at 0.5, again, as I said before, something between 0.5 and 1 a percent. By weight, we begin to see that uh, there is a, uh, maybe the formation of the plateau around there. We did that too with uh, this type of plot, which is uh, a phase angle uh, versus uh, dynamic modulus. And this is what you would expect for a Newtonian liquid. Uh, here at zero, uh, angle phase will be for a um, perfect solid. And in, or here you have the course for this elastic material. If you look here, you have what seems to be going to a finite uh, number for the uh, zero um, angle, which means that uh, the threshold will be from all the plots that we already saw somewhere between 0.5 and 1, the percolation threshold for this type of uh, um, crystals with the length that we were considering that was around 50, um, 20 to 50 was around uh, this um, percentage. And this is uh, uh, a plot of the storage modulus versus the percentage of uh, cellulose. And this is the concentration, the critical concentration for uh, uh, the percolation threshold. And this is just uh, an exponent that has to be with the, uh, say, the, the uh, um, um, morphology or the way that this network is connected. So that critical concentration appears for us around 0.9 uh, by weight of the, uh, the nanofilter, which is very close to the one that we saw already there. So let's consider all that I've shown here. We, uh, we have the mixture of the nanocellulose, of the uh, polyols, and the isocyanate. No reaction yet. But now we are going to see what happens after the reaction, after we have the polyurethane form. So we did it in a closed mode, while we already saw this uh, picture. This were the uh, samples that, that we got. And if we look at the glass fiber uh, temperature transition, 
then uh, we see that by uh, increasing the amount of cellulose, the Tg uh, also increases. And to, uh, we wanted to um, check this value, and instead of using the mixture of polyols, we just used the uh, uh, three functional polyols. We did it everything again, and again we see, of course, with the higher Tg for the two uh, materials, but still, we see a change in this sheet, which is in the order of 14 degrees C. Usually, uh, what people were, uh, you know, reporting in the literature were a change is maybe of one or two degrees C, not much more, uh, with this uh, with the addition of nanocellulose. But this is a very large increase. So something more was going on, and of course, the something more was an interfacial reaction because we have always these hydroxyl groups on the nanocellulose and the same of the uh, hydroxyl groups on the polyol, they can react with the isocyanate. So this is the FTIR, the infrared uh, uh, um, uh, result for the hydrolyzed uh, cellulose. Uh, we react just, just that, just the nanocellulose with an excess of uh, the isocyanate and we end up with this curve, the red one, where you can see the unreactive MDI as a in groups, and here these two are the uh, urethane, due to the urethane groups. But we wanted to see the urethane groups were on the uh, source or on the uh, nanocellulose, were well attached to the nanocellulose, and uh, get rid of the uh, extra isocyanate that had not react. So we did a software extraction, and after that, if you see, the, all the peaks in the FTAR look just the same, except for uh, the unreacted MDI that, you know, we get rid of that. So, the uretins, of course, they were uh, groups that were formed on the surface of the cellulose, and this here is because there are some, uh, it was a polyimic uh, MDI, and there are some groups that uh, are not reactive, and actually, these groups are the ones that can react with the polio. That's why we have an interface reaction that will covalently bond the nanocellulose to the matrix. And here we have the results, the mechanical uh, uh, tensile results. You see the young nodules increasing, this is 5% hydrocellulose uh, here, almost double the, the value. There is also some reduction on the ultimate strain. Still, we have uh, rubber that uh, can be formed up to about 30%. So, this is still a uh, lastomeric uh, material. But, uh, uh. So, we see that uh, the modulus is uh, increased very much for a 5% of crystal, but the increase was not as high as we saw with the, with the percolated suspension. What, almost 3,000 times with the percolated suspension. Why the difference? Well, this has already been seen in the literature for other systems, like a system where there are a high interaction between the nanoparticle and the polymer. And for example, uh, Breguet uh, et al. Uh, said that, you know, if the interaction filler filler and, uh, and the, the interaction between the filler and the matrix are very strong, then you form a softer network of whisker because you lose the interaction nano-row, nano-row, which is a very high modulus uh, network. And instead, you replace that by a network of uh, rows that is, the, the, the links are row polymer row, and that is softer. So you improve the dispersion, you uh, improve the interaction at the interface, but you lose the uh, um, the uh, filler filler uh, percolation high modules. Still, you have something which is uh, much better than a micro composite, but uh, not what you see in suspension. This is our uh, fracture surfaces, and you, you cannot see by uh, SEM. Uh, the nanoparticles, they are too small. But what you can see is the effect of the nanoparticles on the fracture surface. You see, this is the material without nanoparticles. This is only 
point twenty five percent nanoparticles, and you already see that is a uh, uh, much uh, rougher uh, um, uh, surface. That's because when the crack is uh, growing, it finds uh, a particle that is very high modulus, cannot break through the particle, and so it has to deviate and find another uh, another way for for the path of growing. And because of that, you end up with a rougher surface. And because of that, uh, you probably uh, will end up with a tougher uh, material, with more energy for uh, is needed for breakage. Uh, well, these are uh, just uh, these uh, um, parabolic uh, features appear every time that you have like a point uh, in the in the uh, the tip of that uh, parabola, uh, which means that uh, you found uh, nanoparticles. Uh, here's a, a larger magnification showing that that type of flow uh, where it has to go around for the crack for growing. So if we look just at the uh, cross-linked polymers, well, we were able to put uh, the nanofibers in the, uh, as the organic solvent, reinforce the polyurethane, obtain something that is transparent with good mechanical properties. <coughs> And um, the threshold is very low, around 1% by weight. There is a strong interaction at the interface, which shifts the uh, glass transition temperature of the matrix to higher temperature. But again, as I said before, then you may lose uh, something that uh, you wanted, like a, a high modulus of a, a nanofibers uh, network. And I will go fast to the uh, segmented linear polyurethane. This was a commercial polyurethane from Hampton also. And uh, uh, in this type of uh, materials, you have a linear chain, but the linear chain has uh, two parts. One that is uh, what is called soft segment, based in a long chain dial, so it's very flexible. And the other part, which is called hard segment, is formed by the reaction of the short dial with the, the, the isocyanate. And these hard segments. Uh, start, uh, get um, four ordered phase together, like shown schematically in here. These will behave at room temperature as if they were a uh, cross-linking point, uh, while the uh, soft segments give uh, flexibility and so you have an elastomer. So what we did was, again, to prepare a cellular suspension, and to prepare the solution of the polyurethane in a primitive phonomide, we mix both together, we dry it by uh, just a casting and drying, and we end up with a uh, transparent uh, uh, film. Again, well, this is just as we showed uh, before with the cross uh, linked polyurethane. This is 0% here, this is 1% nanocellulose here. And again, you see that there is a very large uh, difference. I don't believe that you will see here, but uh, there is like a, a, a fibrous uh, structure uh, that doesn't appear here, and probably is due to the uh, nanofibers. Again, as I said before, because of that, this material is probably tougher. If we look at the DSC of this material, now we have to remember that this polyurethane has crystalline phases. The hard segments, which are the ones that appear here, this is the melting of the hard segments, and the soft segments that also can crystallize, and they are uh, referencing here. So if we look at what happened by addition of the uh, nanocellulose, there is a slight, but very slight uh, uh, increase in the um, temperature of melting of the soft segment. But uh, the effect on the, uh, as, um, uh, the heat of uh, melting is uh, much more different. You see, it's almost doubled by the addition of 1%. Why? Because the, uh, there is a heterogeneous nucleation on the uh, surface of the nanocrystals. So you form more crystals, uh, facilitate the formation of the soft segment crystals. These are uh, mechanical properties. This is a stress versus a strain in a tensile uh, test. And so you see that there are some different given uh, uh, 0.5, which is in here. 
uh, clearly uh, there's increase in the modulus, but also uh, yield that appears in the 1% uh, nanocellular sample and wasn't there for the new polymer. This is uh, just some simple calculation, simple mechanical model, and what shows is that uh, it will fit a uh, simple mechanical model with an, uh, an aspect ratio of about 50. Uh, the increase in modulus, as we saw already, already that, is about 50 uh, by the addition of 1% cellular. So, and of course, not the lower of the other. It's, it's not as high as the upper bound, and of course, it doesn't fit with the lower bound. If we look at the viscoelastic properties of this material, what I'm going to show is quick. Uh, it's also done in uh, tensile deformation. We apply the stress and we measure the deformation of the material during time. And uh, here we <coughs> unload, so the stress goes to zero again, unload the material and the material recovers. And some permanent set uh, may uh, remain. So these are the uh, experimental results. This is the 0% uh, cellulose. This is 0.1%. And you see that there is a very large uh, difference with only 0.1% uh, by weight of cellulose. 0.5 and 1%. And with 1%, the reduction in heat was about 36%. Per, uh, percent. Just by compar for comparison, uh, this uh, reduction kind of was also obtained in our lab for a composite material, a polypropylene composite material, but adding 40% wood flowers, a regular traditional uh, um, uh, composite. So, and here we are talking only of 1%. Uh, the polyurethane has a low permanent set, uh, 2.5%, but there is no permanent set at all in the nanocomposite. And these segmented polyurethanes, not all of them, but some segmented polyurethanes, uh, show uh, chain memory behavior. What is that? Um, these are smart materials that kind of uh, can remember uh, some original initial shape and they can be deformed. They will keep this uh, temporary shape until some external stimulus is applied and then they recover the original shape but, uh, but by themselves. So um, this is the, the type of film that we use. This is a collaboration with the University of Auburn in the United States. And what you see in the petri dish is a, a hot water. This is the material, so it's the form. It will keep the form unless you put it back to hot water. So um, it recovers the original shape. If, uh, uh, it should be able to do that uh, um, many times, so you, you have to be able to cycle between the form and the original shape. So we have a two-phase system. The thermally reversible shape is uh, uh, the, the, the reason for fixing a transient shape is because we have crystal segments that can be melt and uh, crystallized uh, around the room temperature. And uh, we have uh, the frozen set phase that is responsible of remembering or keeping uh, the uh, uh, original shape. So um, we have to put numbers on, on this and for that we uh, use tensile cycles and just a little better I'll explain. Uh, stress versus strain, so we uh, stretch the polymer or the composite at high temperature, then we lower the temperature, we froze this uh, deformation, uh, deformed uh, uh, shape, if it were, uh, and, and load the sample. If it were perfect, uh, then it will keep this deformed sample, but nothing in life is perfect, so it recover a little bit. Then we heat it back to the uh, initial temperature, and again, if it were perfect, it will go back in here. Because it's not perfect, there's some permanent set and it remains here. If we measure these three uh, um, uh, deformations, we can uh, measure the, uh, calculate the efficiency of the fixing of the shape and recovering the shape. And these are experimental results. This is uh, 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 
when it should uh, fix the sample, but it's around 40% in this case, the recovery is 85%, so much better. So for this, uh, uh, but you still see uh, what we see that the uh, um, properties were not affected by the addition of the nanosignal. So we improved the mechanical properties, but we didn't lose the shape memory properties of the original material. Okay, so if we summarize this uh, thing for the segmented polyurethane, uh, large increase in the modulus, large reduction in the creek with 1% of the uh, nanocrystals, and um, shape memory behavior is maintained. We wanted to do something more. What happens if we do our, uh, synthesize our own shape memory or segmented polyurethane, but we put the nanocellulose during the reaction or after the reaction. Will that change things? So first look, uh, we first look at the, what happens if we add it after the reaction. So it should behave as, as I already showed with the commercial material. And actually, that's what it does. It's, this is a, actually a better uh, fixity, if you can see. Uh, the, uh, this is fixity, well, the original material is about the same, but with the addition of 1% cellulose, the fixity is uh, about 80%. So it improves the fixity for this material too. So that's if we do the same as the, with the commercial one. What happens if we add the nanocellulose during the reaction? Then we lose completely the chain memory uh, uh, properties. And actually, because of the covalent in the, in the facial uh, interaction, we end up with a material which is very, very rigid and actually breaks down at the uh, lowest strength. So it cannot be used for that uh, purpose. It can be used for maybe for uh, structural properties. What happens if we add a uh, uh, conductive polymer to the composite? In this case, for the amine, the, the um, um, Synthesis of polyamine anilin is just the regular one that you can find in the literature. It only was done in the presence of the nanocellulose uh, crystals. Uh, if we look at uh, this is frequency fit, this is again a uh, dynamic uh, uh, viscosity versus frequency, and you see again that the original material is uh, constant viscosity, but then you need to have some viscoelastic uh, component uh, the behavior. And something, you know, uh, different happens uh, between 4 and 10. 10 seems to have a really a steep, uh, um, uh, steep uh, um, shear thinning at low uh, deformation. And of course, the 15% sample behaves as, as, if, as if, if it were a, a gel. So, um, if we, now we have a conductive polymer also dispersed, so we can also measure, uh, do some measure, uh, conductive, uh, conductivity measurement. Not very much of a conductive uh, material, but this is something you can, we cannot measure anything and we can measure something. So uh, maybe something like a percolation happened between 4 and 10 percent because now we can measure uh, the resistivity of the material. And so, just to uh, make some concluding remarks for the whole, uh, um, uh, this uh, whole second talk, that uh, we, were, um, we can put nanocellulose, we can use nanocellulose as a resource of polymers. Uh, obviously, the water-soluble polymers, but also other types of polymers, if we use solvent exchange. That uh, a good dispersion of the nanocrystals uh, lead to large changes in the properties of the uh, um, composites, something between 1 and 10 percent, and that will depend, of course, on the uh, nanocrystals, the, and the nano, uh, sorry, and the uh, matrix, and the interaction between the two. Uh, that there is a strong interaction uh, in the uh, if there is a strong interaction in the, between the polymer and the uh, filler, that's very good, of course, for load transfer and for reinforcement. But it also changes, in this case, because it's a nano reinforcement, it changes the polymer behavior itself. So the matrix uh, may respond differently 
as uh, when it wasn't uh, the kind of reinforcement there. If the interaction with the matrix is too strong, then you may lose the fiber fiber interaction. So it has to be a balance if you have if you want to uh, take advantage of the uh, network of uh, high modulus uh, rod, rod. And uh, the composite contain containing functionalized and unicellular functions, special functionality, special uh, properties too. And in this case, we only did it with a, a, a conductive polymer, but you can think of other uh, modifications to find uh, different uh, functional properties in the final composite. And in this uh, particular case of the conductive uh, polyamylene, there was some aggregation because when the polyamylene grows through the crystal, it also provokes uh, some agglomeration. So that's why the threshold is between 4 and 10 instead of being around 1, what was the, uh, when you have, what we find when we have a good uh, dispersion of the nanocrystal. What to expect? Uh, well, microprivileged cellulose, we already saw in the first talk, is already becoming commercial. Uh, so one could expect that as this uh, become, you know, the volumes uh, grow and uh, grow, then uh, we would expect that the price will go down and maybe some other type of cellulose will become viable. Uh, in research, uh, we saw that uh, the incorporation of surface modification is appearing, you know, beginning to appear every time more frequently, and also the attempts to orient the fibers in preferential uh, direction. For example, to spoon fibers or uh, electro spoon some uh, nanofibers. And all of these to take advantage of the small size of the crystal, the high modulus, wide availability, and also, which is not much seen yet, the capacity for self-assembly. And um, for this, because I, I showed some uh, of our results, I wanted to show my book uh, here for the um, uh, the results I showed is uh, the, my collaboration has been Dr. Um, Markovic, Monsieur Ricky, and the, the, my collaborators are all is uh, Dr. Maria Wad from the Auburn University. And of course, uh, most of us have uh, uh, support from our university, from uh, CONICET, the National Research Council, and the uh, Agency for the Promotion of Science and Technology in Argentina, and in this case, for the, from the Women High Foundation too. And thank you to all. And thanks, uh, finally, I will say the part of the organizer for inviting me. to see the price uh, to be reduced. And 
uh, still, there are some companies, not just university companies, working in uh, uh, the enzymatic uh, treatment to get the uh, nanocellulose, which may be uh, also some way of getting uh, cheaper uh, nanocellulose. Because, uh, as I say, this one is. Uh, no, it's, uh, uh, I mean, they are not robots, so it depends on what you want to do. But are uh, very, very nice for for uh, reinforcement and very nice to get transparent composite. You can do that uh, with uh, microfluidic cellulose. So for that, it's okay and it's good. Uh, 